It's Meet the Biz time. We are here with uh, a really amazing guy. I mean, he is a two-time Emmy-nominated producer. He is a writer, a singer, a voiceover artist, an actor, Mr. Stephen Wishnoff, our friend Mr. Stephen Wishnoff. Hello. Well, hello there. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, how are you during this crazy time? Uh, trying to stay busy, you know, keep myself occupied. Uh, yeah. Best I can. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for all the many times that you've come to teach at, at, at Meet the Biz. I mean, the classes, what were the names of the classes? Oh, am I allowed to say? Yeah. Well, first there was the shit they didn't tell you. Then there was more shit they didn't tell you. Then there was even more shit they didn't tell you. Mm -hmm. And I think we even did the rest of the shit they didn't tell you. <laughs> well, that's, that's a bunch of shit. <laughs> it, it, was, it was a lot of shit. Oh my God, I love it. Well, what a way to start an interview. I love it. And you know what? I have to say, I remember the first time that I met you. You do? I do. It, it's this, you have this presence that's like, who is this man? And I remember being, and it was just, it's, it's actually one of the nights I will, it, you know, in one of my top 20 memories that I, I remember being there with Jerry Jewell at the Hollywood Bowl, and there was Mr. Stephen Wishnow. Was that the Liza concert? That was. Oh, okay. That was, and I, I, I loved it. We were like saying, do you, do, you know, Jerry saying, do you have Jerry Jewell down on the list? And, this, and you went, Jerry Jewell, remember that? Yes, and they didn't, so I made them put her on it. I loved it. I have a cat that is clawing at the patio window that wants to go out. Can I step away for one second? Yes, what's your cat's name? Maggie. Maggie! Oh, she go she right ahead. We'll, we'll wait. Maggie. I, you know, you know what I made me think of Maggie is the name is um, Margaret Hamilton. Margaret Hamilton, by the way, was the Wicked Witch of the West in The Wizard of Oz. <sighs> okay, now we're back. Hey! <laughs> How are you? I need an animal so bad. Well, I have Maggie the cat, you know, Tennessee Williams reference. Ah, okay. Okay. We all have our references to names. What a Tennessee Williams. Well, my downstairs neighbors have cats named uh, Tennessee, Stella, and Brando. And okay. they, used, they used to have Stanley and Blanche, too. I, oh, my God. But they're not here anymore. No. They moved on. That's why they have Tennessee, Stella, and Brando. Oh, God, I can't wait till I get an animal and name it Peter. Peter? Or Inspector Clouseau. <laughs> oh, my God. You, since we were talking about the Hollywood Bowl with Liza, uh -huh. what, you know, I just want to throw out the name Liza Minnelli. What? I mean, I remember I was at another concert and she like shouted your name <laughs> stage. Yeah. I was like, I love this. What's that was a, a different year at the Hollywood Bowl. It was my birthday. And she wished me a happy birthday from the stage in front of 18,000 of my dearest friends. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I know, I was there. I was going, my God, how did you meet Liza? Well, what's your connection? I've known Liza since the 90s. Um, let's see. How do I explain this? <laughs> you know how every actor has a survival job? Or, oh. or at least you hope. We hope. 
mine uh, was in the piano bars in New York City. I used to sit behind the piano and carry on like a madman for eight or nine hours a night. And Liza was friends with another friend of mine, or actually several other friends of mine. And she used to come in to the piano bars and hang out. Sometimes she'd sing, rarely, but sometimes. And I got to know her. And um, in particular, one night, there was an after hours piano bar, which meant in New York, that means it didn't open till five o'clock in the morning. Um, well, the bars in New York are open till four. So by the time you finish your shift and you go to an after hours place, it's 5 a.m. Yeah. And you have your dark sunglasses at the ready. Um, but there used to be a place called the Five Oaks. It actually was a speakeasy in the 20s. And you would go down these narrow stairs to the basement of a building at Grove Street in Hudson. And, um, or West, was it West 10? Anyway, it was the West Village of New York. Mm -hmm. You'd go down the stairs and Marie Blake, who, when I first met her, had to have been 80 years old, but played the meanest stride piano you have ever heard and could play anything, yeah. uh, was at the piano. And my friends waved me over to a table in the corner where they were, and it was very dark. It, good thing it was dark. You really don't want to see what's in a basement in New York. And um, I felt something at my leg under the table. And I look under the table, and there's this face looking back at me. Hi, I'm Lysha. Oh, wait a minute. Her face was looking up from under the table? Well, because she had dropped her cigarettes. Oh back when she used to smoke. Right. This was a long time ago. And, um, you know, I've known her casually since then, yeah. over many, many years in New York. And then um, out here in Los Angeles, I was still working in New York and commuting, working for TV Land, and we were producing the TV Land Awards. And Liza, who played Lucille II on Arrested Development, um, presented the show Arrested Development with the Making a Future Classic Award. So I got to work with her then as well. Fun. And that's how I know Liza. I love that. And that what a great story. I've never heard that story. And, and the way you described it about being in those bars, the piano bars, and I just saw you there playing the piano for people and, and singing your own songs and and carrying on like a fool. <laughs> and then you brought up, you brought up that you produced the TV Land Awards. Well, I was the producer of the online segment. Got it. Very nice. And um, because Liza was presenting, that was an important thing. In fact, I have somewhere, I have video footage of her showing Gary Coleman, her father, a book with the cover of Gigi, um, it was a book about war, uh, costume and wardrobe in classic television, uh, classic film. And I have video footage somewhere of Liza going, Gary, look, this is my father's movie. <laughs> oh my God. That's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, he was wealth, more interested in the gumballs. The wealth of stories you have through your career and life. I suppose that's true. Have you yeah. thought of writing a book? I've thought about it. I kind of started doing it. Then I stopped doing it because other projects, you know, take precedent. Yeah. Um, there's no shortage of stories, that's for sure. I mean, there were people I was even calling to ask their permission to reference them. Yeah. You know, because I don't want to do that without telling somebody. Uh, I mean, if it's somebody let's say famous with a household name, I don't necessarily ask them if I can mention them. All right. Um, and anybody that I would mention in a negative light, I do not use their name at all. Uh, right. You know, it's, right. I, I think that's bad form. Yeah, yeah. 
with certain uh, exceptions. Ah, uh, okay. Well, you know, bouncing off of Liza to, to the film that everybody loves, um, I use every year I would watch Judy Garland go down the yellow brick road to the land of Oz. Uh, but you, you lived and breathed for five years in a different kind of Oz on HBO. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> that, tell us. Tell that, us. What, what? Okay. That, was, that was another world, yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's just, let's look from, from night and day, right? Yeah, yeah, it really was. Um, that w uh, I was incarcerated as Tony Masters inmate 98M922 uh, in the HBO drama Oz for five years from seasons two through the end. Um, and the portion of the prison that I lived, Oz was short for Oswald State Penitentiary. And the part of Oz that I lived in was called Emerald City. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Well, it was a special part of the, the prison where um, you had different privileges. Um, there weren't bars, there were uh, glass walls, or plexiglass walls, actually. Um, you could wear your own clothing, you didn't have to wear a uniform. Um, and so it, it was the experimental portion of the prison. It actually was the Gilligan's Island of prisons because Oz was set up to be um, representative of the population at large. And so there was a gang of Latinos, there was a gang of Irish, there was a gang of the Sicilian Italians, there was a, a gang of bikers, there was a gang of Muslims, there was a gang of the gays, hello. Um, there was uh, a group they called the others, people who didn't quite fit into any other category, but were chosen to be part of the Emerald City experiment. So by having one group from each different part of the population, I refer to it as the Gilligan's Island of prisons. Wow, I love that, I love that. That could be, a, a, I mean, talking about books, you could write all about that experience. I mean. Uh, yes, and, and, and the book that I'd write will have a, a good deal about Oz in it, um, mostly because it was an amazing experience. You know, right. people use the expression, oh, it was a family. No, it, this really was a family because you were locked in for 12 hours within four, in a four walled space. Um, and whether it was functional or dysfunctional depended on the moment, but for the most part, it was a wonderful experience. And I got to work with so many people that I'd respected and admired for years yeah. um, on that show, particularly from the world of Broadway. What, Rita Moreno, huh? Well, Rita Moreno as Sister Pete, to be sure. Um, I was Betty Buckley's pianist on the show. Um, that's That was actually quite something. Um, <laughs> ben Vereen was on the show. Joel Gray was on the show. Joel Gray actually did a, uh, a drawing of me in character on a break between scenes one day, which I still have. Do you, do you put you frame it and everything? It's not framed. I suppose it should be. I would. I would. It would be great to see. I mean, it was on a yellow legal pad, but I have it. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. Of course, we worked with Ann Stiller, um, who I adored, obviously. Yeah. yeah. You know. Um, and obviously, you and I have a mutual friend in her daughter, so. Ah, Amy. Yeah. Um, I should say Ann Mira. I should not say Ann Stiller. I should say Ann Mira. I know, it took a little second, and I went, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but there were so many, I mean, and B.D. Wong, for Christ's sake, and you know, and people said to me, well, how did you really get along with people, you know, between stuff if you're always hating each other and everybody was always fighting? And I said, you know, that was the prison drama. 
The fact is, J.K. Simmons, who was the head of the Aryans, and I knew each other from when he was doing Guys and Dolls on Broadway. <laughs> so it's a little hard, you know, after hours to take home the evil. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God, I'm just listening to, you know, I, I have to say, right after we finish this interview, I'm going on to Amazon Prime and getting the box set of Oz. And oh, then, please do. And then when we get out of quarantine, I want you to sign it. <laughs> I love this. Oh, come on. I was like a glorified background actor, I, you know. You I, were, there are no small parts. Well, there are no small Stevens, so there you go. <laughs> I mean, people would say to me, you know, what are you, what's your function on the show? And I'm like, to block the reflection of the crane in the plexiglass. <laughs> That's funny. I well, mean, that... are, it's true, though. There, there were times they would place us so that you couldn't see the baby boom in, in the reflection of the plexiglass. My God. That's funny. Well, just the way you speak, I mean, it shows what an amazing writer you are. Um, and you have a, now, I know you had a writing workshop that you put together. Do you, are you still, still do. doing that? Oh, yes. We still do it every week. We meet actually via Zoom. Um, there's a Monday night, a Tuesday night, and a Thursday night. And each week we read one of the writer's work. And, um, you know, we do it as a table read. There are actors and writers in the group so that we get a really decent read from it. And then we give each other notes and the writer goes off on their own and cries in their coffee and fixes what they need to fix. Right, right. Or not, you know, it's all personal preference. Right, well, you were also the writer, what, for the LA Emmys? Yeah, I did that for five years. Now, what, what is it about writing that you love? Making something up where there was nothing before. It's the same thing I like about acting. Uh, you know, to quote Sunday in the Park with George, look, I made a hat where there never was a hat. I love that musical. What a good quote. Yeah, well, you know. And, and it's also good. It's helped me in writing the stuff that I write personally as fiction because writing an awards show and particularly one that I had access to the talent who I was writing for, mm. I learned very quickly how to write in other people's voices. Um, so, you know, that's an invaluable tool. Anybody that has to write for a TV show or for a movie or anything like that, you have to write in a voice that's not yours. Mm, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the overall picture is your voice. Yeah. But each of the characters has to have their own voice. And if you're doing an established show, you know, if you were, if you had been a writer on Will and Grace, you have to write in the voice of the showrunner, of the executive producers for those characters. Right. So it, become, it becomes a multi-layered thing. And writing an award show really helped me with that. I think that's, that's why a lot of times at Performing Arts Studio West, I tell everybody when they start their monthly scenes or their monthly songs uh, to, to write a page or a, 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 even a paragraph, but I, I like a full page, if not more, of who, who are you as this character? It's so important. I mean, you, to know the backstory of a character, going into it as an actor, is key, because then, then you know how they're going to respond in a scene. Um, obviously, if it's a full-length work and you get to read the whole work, so much the better. But, you know, even, for example, mm. when I uh, auditioned for the Netflix series Hollywood for Ryan Murphy, right? Um, I was given sides, not 
the scene. And as it happens, I was the first one in the room for the role that I booked, but um, the casting director very wisely asked me, do you have any questions? And I did. And I asked, I said, listen, it says I'm referring to her as Mrs. Cooper, but it says the character's name is something else entirely. Is this a play within a play? Love that. And she said, well, yes, as a matter of fact, it is. You're playing an actor playing this character opposite this woman who's playing Mrs. Cooper. Oh, great. So this is where improv comes in handy. Instant backstory fills your head and you go in and you do it. It turns out that the actress who was playing the character playing Mrs. Cooper was Mira Sorvino. And let me tell you, Mira Sorvino and improv, oh, she's spectacular. Oh, how wonderful to work with her. Yes, yes it was. It was, <laughs> it was a delightful experience. Well, that whole set, the whole crew, everybody from my director on down was delightful. Well, that's the number one hit show right now. Everybody's like watching it in quarantine. Well, I hope they keep watching it. <laughs> Go back and watch it a second time. And a third time. At least. Maybe okay. there'll be residuals. <laughs> oh my God, wouldn't that be nice? Um, I don't know how it works on Netflix, so I couldn't yeah. tell you. Yeah. Um, talking about producing yeah. and writing, uh, you created uh, and uh, executive produced the wonderful web series, um, Life Interrupted with a star-studded cast? Yes, I did. Um, Life Interrupted was quite an experience. Yeah. I ended up writing it, producing it, directing it. It was a little more than I had bargained for. <laughs> yeah. But um, it was an amazing experience. It yeah. really was. And what a cast. I, I couldn't ask for better. Oh my God, Mason Reese. Um, uh, Allison Arndrim, who we had here uh, mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago, Don Wells, Aaron Murphy, Michael Learned. Yeah, and Brandon Cruz and Robbie Rist, and yeah, yeah it, was, it was quite a collection of friends, to put it bluntly. That, it, it, if we had not all been friends, I don't think it would have worked. Right. Why? Well, Professional is professional is professional. And as you've heard me say in workshop, and I will say it here, the three things you always need to be are prepared, prompt, and professional. And these people are all professionals. Mm -hmm. But the fact that we were friends gave us a little bit of latitude in that we were all focused on getting out what needed to get out and to do what needed to be done. But we were on an insanely tight schedule. I mean, I had two days that were 15 pages. Oh my God. Because we were gonna lose the location if we didn't finish in time. And damn if we didn't do it, and I, we were out on ex at exactly the right minute of the right hour, both days. Yeah, And it was because, you know, friends had each other's back. We were all, nobody pulled any diva trips. Yeah. Everybody just did what they needed to do. And so it became a lot of fun. And if anybody wants to watch Life Interrupted, they can find it on YouTube. Yeah. Um, there's the full half hour version um, is available to watch. As well as, gosh, all the promos we did for it and everything else. So that's there. But yeah, it was a wonderful experience. And even how that came along, Mason and I met, full circle, working on the TV Land Awards. Mm. He was there as a child actor who had been a child actor uh, as a commercial spokesperson. He was best known for Underwood Devil Ham in the 70s. Yeah. And he and Rodney Allen Rippey, who was best known for Jack in the Box, yeah. um, we made them do an interview together as though they were having a Biggie and Tupac East Coast, West Coast feud, right. um, which became very funny. And 
um, Mason and I stayed in touch over the years, and I guess it was 10, 11 years later, I got a call from him one day and he said, I'd really like to get back in front of the cameras, something scripted, but I don't know what I should do. What should I do? And my answer was, I don't know. I haven't written it yet. <laughs> I love that answer. It's You have that gift of making things happen. I suppose I do, um, you know. Thanks, Barbara Eden. <laughs> da -da, da -da 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 -da. Yeah, and I used to play that in the piano bars too, but we'd do it with the lyrics. Oh, and what a voice you have. Well, thank you. I, there, there, there's one in there. I am what I am. Starts much lower than that, but thank you. I... <laughs> Well, you did that show. You were the lead in that show. Yeah, I've, I've done La Cage a couple of times mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, as Alban and uh, would happily do it again yeah. before I'm 107. <laughs> well, and I would love to see it live and on stage. So would I. Mm -hmm. So would I. What made you become a member of the diversity committee and what did you at the tv academy at the tv academy um well someone i know uh was one of the governors at the academy and this this was at a time when um it was just before oscars so white really exploded mm. Everybody was feeling there was a lack of diversity in representation in film and television. Yeah. And I was approached because they knew that I had done a lot of work um, over at the LGBT Center for LifeWorks, the youth program. Yeah. And um, was actually involved with Outset, which is the LGBTQ AI LMNOP. Um, <laughs> Uh, student film project. Yeah. Uh, I was there for the founding of that. And I was asked if I would like to be a part of this. And I said, certainly. And I ended up producing several very large events for them. Um, I did uh, the business of being LGBT with uh, that one was with Alec Mappa. Jerry Jewel. Jewel and um, Chaz Bono. Yeah, I love that one. And I did one LGBT above and below the line in prime time, um, hosted by Bruce Valanche with Billy Crystal uh, as our premier guest. But th that was a panel of thousands because I actually said, I want at least one of everything on that stage. And it wasn't that hard to find. There, you know, we had we had an actor model who was deaf. Right. We had people of color. We had people who were L, G, B, T, and Q. I don't know if they were I. I didn't ask. Yeah. None of my business. It's none of my business what anybody is. But if you're going to put it out there, and I'm doing an event that needs you to yeah. represent, I'll call you. And Bruce hosted for me, um, another one I've known a million years. And um, it was, that was an amazing event. I also did one called LGBT Youth in Television. It was portrayals of young people in television uh, that Kathy Griffin hosted for me. Oh, wow. So I, I did a lot of large events for her, for that. I love, uh, you know, I hear man and many hats, but you seriously, you open your closet, the hats just fall out of the closet. You have so much. Yes, they do. Well, <laughs> I mean, for the most part, I don't believe there's anything I really can't do, yeah. except perhaps give birth. Um, oh, damn it, you'll try. <laughs> no, I don't think I want that. Okay. <laughs> Um, but, 
you know, if you set your mind to it, there, you could, most things are possible. Yeah. Which well, is, you know, something I, I, I love about the Meet the Biz workshops is that everybody comes with an open mind saying, I want to try this or I want to do this. How do I do this? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the first step is seeing what you do know and then admitting what you don't know and being open to taking that in. Mm. It's so, it's so, I mean, you have to be, you have to be, because if you block it, how can you grow? Well, exactly. You know, you block the roots to a tree, the tree's not going to grow. Yeah. But you have to have the roots before you have the tree. So there you go. That's what the training's about. One more question. Yes. What is your biggest love in life? Well, at the moment, my, my cat, Maggie. <laughs> Maggie. That she's gotten me through the shelter at home and all of that. Yeah. You know, having, having a creature to care for who cares for me. Yeah. Connection. Yeah. It's about that. And she understands me and I understand her. She, I mean, obviously I knew she wanted to go out on the balcony. Like Steve. Yeah, she actually has a very peculiar, a specific meow sound that she makes when she's calling me. So I, I assume it's her name for me. Can you do that sound for us? No, I will not do that. <laughs> okay. Oh, by the way, do you like Steve or Steven? I don't care. Oh, okay. Just don't call me late for dinner. Mm -hmm.